So, Martin Luther and the Reformation. Born 1483. If you've been here the last few weeks, you know that Lorenzo de' Medici, Lorenzo the Great, is basically the de facto ruler there in Florence. So he's born right in the middle, you would say, of the high renaissance in Italy. He was born on November 10th. He was named for St. Martin of Tours. So if you know anything about St. Martin of Tours, then you know that his kind of patron namesake was uh, that character. He was born on his birthday, and that's why he got that name. His father, Hans Luther, owned a small copper mine. We've talked in the last few weeks about a kind of rising middle class over the last couple of centuries, sparked probably primarily by the Crusades, which opened up trade, and trade required places of trade, and out of that came these free cities, and these free cities gave rise to a new basis for economy from the old feudal manners. And so what we begin to see are a sort of a burgeoning expression of various kinds of economic activities in various quarters, and as it turns out, Hans Luther had been able, just because of the circumstances of his life and by dint of hard work and uh, enterprise and so on, been able to acquire this small copper mine. So he actually had some employees and was doing reasonably well. He wasn't wealthy. He certainly wasn't upper class or noble or anything like that, but he was doing better than, say, the peasants had done in, in the centuries past. So this was kind of the beginning of a new chapter of European history, and he was very much a part of it. Luther, Martin Luther, was born the uh, second child of nine. And Hans Luther, who was quite, quite the entrepreneur, recognized immediately that his young son Martin might be the key to his own social security program. He realized that Martin was brilliant uh, and that if he played his educational cards right, that Martin might be the next step up in this upward mobility of the social order of that day. And so at considerable expense, Hans Luther invested heavily in Martin's education and he was given the very best education that a person could afford at that particular time in history that they could actually acquire. He went to grammar school, as was called grammar school, from 1497 to 1501 and then entered the University of Erfurt in 1501, which was widely regarded as the finest university in what we would call Germany. It would be something like the Harvard, at least of that part of the world at that time. It was very expensive and, of course, very selective. But Martin had done so well in his studies, just devouring every topic that was put before him with a kind of voracious academic appetite that he was certainly qualified to be part of this school and this educational program. He writes later that this was the first time in his life he had ever seen a complete Bible. It was, of course, in Latin. It was chained to the wall in the library. Bibles were very rare in those days, and Luther had always sort of held in the back of his mind the prospect, maybe someday, of seeing a complete Bible, because most of what he'd ever learned of the Bible was simply through the church, through the priest, and so on, the stained glass windows, that kind of thing, but never had an opportunity to actually read it for himself and have any kind of personal engagement with its content. So he talks about how during his time at the university, he would spend hours reading the Bible, just, just uh, almost uh, shocked at the humanity of the book and the stories and all of those interesting aspects of it that probably many of us take for granted. But for him, this was kind of the first exposure to it. He was kind of an accelerated student. He made it through more rapidly than many students did and actually graduated second in his class in 1502. I've always been encouraged by this. I don't know who graduated first. I don't know that anybody knows, but whoever it was, I doubt they had as much impact as the guy that came in second. And so for all of us who've gone through life kind of being the ones in that class have also ran, you know, I've also participated, but uh, Martin is sort of our great uh, inspiration here. So anyway, second in his class in 1502. He stayed on at the university for three more years, attending what we would call law school. 
He got his MA in law in 1505. It'd be something like get a, a, a JD these days. He had a law degree, and that did qualify him then to hang out a shingle and become a practitioner of law, which was in fact exactly what was supposed to happen. He had always been a little bit uncomfortable with that and felt that it might be a bit self-serving, but he was also obedient to his father's wishes. His father had, after all, been putting up the money for all of this education, and so Martin was prepared to do as his father had really insisted that he do, and this lawyerly profession that Luther was supposed to enter was, in fact, going to elevate the entire family. And so Hans Luther was quite excited about all of this, and in fact, just after Martin graduated, he went home and there was a huge celebration in which all the family, all of the friends got together. There were balloons, you know, and all this stuff, and they were kind of really excited about this new achievement and the new prospects that were being opened up in the life of Martin Luther and for the whole family. And as many of you may know, if you know anything about his story, one of the probably most famous little pieces of his story was his return back to the university after that celebration with his family in which he's riding along on horseback and all of a sudden a thunderstorm breaks out rather suddenly and he being a product of his time still had in spite of his education a quite superstitious view of the universe this was just taken for granted at the time we've commented on this before where you have witches and goblins and all kinds of strange creatures hiding around in the shadows of nature and a belief that if you're in a thunderstorm that's got to be God's anger toward you and so this is making Martin quite nervous he's already a little nervous because he's had misgivings for some time about this lawyer career and whether it was too self-serving and but he didn't want to buck his father and so he's been in this sort of precarious state of a troubled conscience and now here he is just after this big celebration of his achievements riding along and he feels nature and maybe God behind nature just expressing a certain degree of anger and then it happened. Now this is a woodcut drawing out of an old textbook which depicts Luther here having been thrown from his horseback because lightning struck Within just a few feet, if you've ever been in that situation, you know how terrifying that is. Luther fell to the ground into the mud and the rain and so on. And in this moment of panic, he cries out one of the most famous prayers of terror ever heard. Help me, St. Anne. I will become a monk. And all of history changed. So Martin Luther, in 1505 made a rash vow to become a monk because he thought that lightning bolt had come straight from God and God had simply missed the first time and the second one was on the way and so before the second one hit Martin took that oath and he joined an Augustinian monastery that happened to be there in Erfurt two weeks later his father was furious Hans Luther had high regard for the church, held it in high esteem, was a devout Roman Catholic himself, held the personnel of the church in relatively low esteem, as did many people at that time. We have talked about the erosion of the moral capital of the highest leadership of the church, which had been happening for some time. Monks were generally viewed as sort of religious beggars, you know. They took a vow of poverty, which turned them basically into a kind of dependent class. And your form of good works was in part supporting them. At least that was the perception. That certainly wasn't universal. But that was a wide perception, especially among people who worked hard, like Hans. And he looked at this class of clergy and religious types out there who just didn't seem to be contributing much that was really essential to life as they were living it. So anyway, this decision by Martin to become a monk didn't meet at, with Hans's approval at all and there was a quite a tragic uh, uh, rift that took place in the family between Martin and his father at that moment because of his decision to join the monastery. For his part, while he was in these early years of being a monk, Martin Luther went through the most 
agonizing experiences of trying to unburden his conscience. He later said of this time that if anyone could have been saved by monkery, it would have been Martin, you know, because he did all the stuff that we associate with late medieval monastic life. It was fasts, it was lengthy prayers, he did do this kind of self-flagellation, you know, where you take a whip and beat your back till it starts bleeding. He did that. He would spend hours a day in the confessional booth. This was almost uh, humorous in the monastery because these father confessors would see Martin going, and all, oh no, not Brother Martin, it's your turn today. You know, they kind of try to avoid this guy because most, I mean, let's face it, just between you and me, how many sins can you commit in a monastery in one day? <laughs> and three, <laughs> thank you. So, you know, most of these monks, they're in there every day. They, they, you know, they might take five, ten minutes. Or if they're really going to be penetrating, maybe 15 minutes to confess all their sins from the previous day, Luther would literally spend two to three hours. And this is part of his genius. That many times religious geniuses in history have been practically neurotic, you know. And Luther was neurotic. I think that's the right word for it. He was such a genius, he had such powers of insight, and having studied law, he understood that there is not simply the external action, but the internal motive. Motive plays into the seriousness of the crimes. And so Luther knew that at least to some degree, an examination of the prior day required that he sift through his motives. And as he did so, he found himself uncovering the doors of hell. And he was constantly riddled with this feeling of the depth of his corruption. And he wanted somehow to have some sense of conscience unburdened. And so he would confess his sins as he, he believed as they all did that if you didn't confess all your sins if you left some out if you omitted them then your, your forgiveness wasn't complete so he had to be exhaustive and exhausting and so he would confess these and then for one moment he would feel the relief when the priest would say te absolvo I forgive you and then just as he walked out of the confessional booth within five minutes he felt his own depth of corruption rising up once again. He wanted to run right back in and say, oh, wait a minute, there's more. You know. At one point, his father superior there in this monastery, a man by the name of Staupitz, who was, a, who was a, 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 an influence in Luther's life all his life, even after the Reformation started, this man still had a significant role to play. But Staupitz took Luther aside and said, man, you're taking yourself too seriously. You've got to lighten up. You know. And Luther famously said to him, as he records himself later, I have no peace. I have no peace. And so in spite of the fact that he'd become a monk, in spite of the fact that he'd abandoned his very luminous career that seemed to be you know, so promising for him, even now, in these circumstances, he still had this deep sense of the trauma of God's righteousness and God's justice. Well, Staupitz encouraged Luther to occupy himself with further studies, hoping, of course, it would distract Luther somewhat from these internal psychological difficulties. And so Luther, in 1507, was ordained to the priesthood. He went through the further training to become a priest. That itself became somewhat traumatic for him. By this time, he'd mended fences with his father. His father had sort of, you know, accommodated himself to the new... Martin uh, that it was going to be his son from this point on and so once again the family showed up for the uh, occasion of Martin Luther celebrating his first mass but this turned out to be quite a uh, moment as well Luther was just in the middle of reciting the words of the mass you know in the Catholic view of things the words of consecration are spoken in Latin and the miracle of transubstantiation takes place in which the substance of bread and wine become the substance of the body and blood of, blood of Christ. And Luther did that, believed it, and then all of a sudden it hit him. He was holding the very body and blood of Christ. And he froze, he panicked right there on the spot. He couldn't finish the Mass. He was so traumatized at the thought of the holy body and blood of Christ being held in his hands, he actually had to be helped through the rest of it. 
It was kind of an embarrassing, awkward moment, but that's just how deep was his sense of the presence of God and the threat of God's presence that seemed to dominate in his life at that time. In 1508, a man by the name of Duke Frederick, Elector of Saxony, wanted to start a university. Now, I've talked in the last couple of weeks about the rise of what are called free universities. During the feudal system, if you wanted an education, if you wanted to escape, really, from being a peasant, you went to the monastery. And there you could become a monk, you could be educated, you could have a very different life. Still be labor in that life, but it wouldn't be the same kind of thing as being a peasant out in the fields. But with the rise of trade came the rise of medieval free towns, and out of the free towns came universities. And there were various people around Europe in the Holy Roman Empire and elsewhere who were wanting to establish these universities. And Duke Frederick was one of them. He was the ruling nobleman over Saxony, which was a province in the Holy Roman Empire. He was called Elector of Saxony because he was one of that class of people who had the power to elect the emperor when the previous emperor died. And so he's called Duke Frederick Elector of Saxony. But what he wanted to do was start a university, the University of Wittenberg. And he was shopping around for prospective faculty members. He sent an email to Staupitz and said, hey, you got anybody over there that would make a good original, you know, initial faculty for my university? Staupitz thought, this is perfect, you know, get Barton out there into the real world and, uh, you know, maybe he can uh, sort of feel better about himself. So Staupitz immediately recommended Martin Luther to be the uh, part of the original faculty and that's what he did. So within the first year or so of the university uh, existing, Martin was on the faculty there. And of course, you know that Martin Luther, Luther's entire career is associated to the University of Wittenberg. So he began, uh, began teaching there. He wasn't qualified yet academically to teach Bible or theology, but he did teach a kind of classic work in Catholic theology called the Sentences of Lombard. And so that was his main uh, task, and he taught philosophy, Aristotelian philosophy, and certain other topics. In 1510, he was Excuse me, I'm going to just adjust this slightly. That's the right In 1510, he was commissioned to go to Rome on official church business uh, with a kind of a little cluster of other monks, and they were going to uh, go to Rome and engage in whatever business was their obligation at that point. But he was very much excited about this because. Rome was, of course, the city of the martyrs. Rome was the great capital, the central sanctuary of the Christian religion worldwide. He kind of thought this was like going to the very heart of that holy place. And again, he was sort of hoping that he could go, if he could go through the religious regimen, regimen that would be a, a part of his experience there, that that might give him some sense of the relief he'd been looking for. And so he went to Rome intending to do all the things that a religious pilgrim would do. And you may know some of the story of this. He was going up cathedrals, kissing each step, that kind of thing, you know, and so on. Uh, and he didn't really find that that, re that did much for his conscience. But at the same time, he was deeply disillusioned by his experience of surveying what was happening in Rome. It was very similar to someone going to Jerusalem in the first century and expecting a house of prayer for the nation, nations and finding it to be a den of thieves. You know, that's kind of what he experienced in Rome. He saw a very pharisaical kind of uh, professional attitude, not much concern about the true deep spiritual welfare of the flock, a lot of people having a lot of opulent, uh, very, very uh, luxurious lives at the expense of the money flowing in from various parts of the Catholic world, and immorality was rampant even among the clergy. All of this was so conspicuous that Luther found himself very deeply deflated by the entire experience. Some would say this may be the true beginning of the Reformation when he went to Rome and was so disappointed in his uh, experience there. I don't know if that's the case, but certainly he was bitterly disillusioned. I mentioned last week that while he was in Rome in 1510, he did meet Michelangelo, who was working on the Sistine Chapel ceiling at the time, and he also met Raphael, the other famous Renaissance artist, there's been some speculation, as I 
intimated last week that Luther and Michelangelo maintained something of a quiet correspondence over the years. There is no definitive answer to this yet. It's certainly not original research on my part, but there are people who are looking at this and who have suggested this and are continuing to explore it. So I'm just simply saying that as a possibility, but certainly not anything that's proven to anyone's historical you know, uh, certainty. But he certainly met Michelangelo at this point, and they formed some kind of acquaintance at the time. In 1512, Luther completed studies to become a doctor of theology. He enjoyed the studies. He wasn't so sure he wanted the degree. Because once you had conferred upon you the degree doctor of theology, you became a public person. You were expected to be someone who would stand out front and represent the Catholic Church and basically be one who was both a theologian, thinker for the church, and an apologist on its behalf. And all of this, while Luther was certainly a faithful Roman Catholic at this point, put him into a, a, a situation that he didn't really feel very comfortable with. To be in the limelight like that, he didn't feel that he had the requisite competence to hold that kind of office, but nevertheless, once again, Staupitz more or less prevailed upon him, and he acceded to that pressure and took the degree of Doctor of Theology, and that was in 1512. He began lecturing, therefore, publicly from that point on, both in the university and in publicly available lectures for anyone who wished to come. In 1513, he wrote his first biblical commentary, which was on the book of Psalms, and it's still out there. So if, if, if you're like I am and like to kind of poke around in dusty old used bookstores, uh, you may come across a volume or two of Luther's commentaries on Psalms. And if you do, and if you flip it open and it costs 50 cents, buy it, buy several, you know. Uh, it's, uh, it's really quite a classic uh, uh, work and it's well worth reading. What's interesting about it is it's pre-Reformation Luther. So it's still very much Catholic Martin Luther, you know, nevertheless giving a, a very competent uh, treatment of the Psalms, interesting reading. In 1510, however, we have this incident I was alluding to earlier in which he was commissioned to write a commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans. And so he plows in, he's doing his research, and he's working through verse by verse, and he gets to the first roadblock in his thinking, which is, as I was saying earlier, Paul's thesis statement for the entire book of Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed, and that's where Luther got stuck. He couldn't quite wrap his brain around those two ideas. I am not ashamed and the righteousness of God. Because for him, it was the righteousness of God that provoked the greatest shame in his life. When he thought of the righteousness of God, he thought of all the lights in the universe being turned on, white hot searing examination of his inner life and being exposed for what he thought he was, the hypocrite, the duplicitous uh, person, you see, who was so tainted uh, at the de deepest uh, 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 core of his being. And he, he would have preferred, Paul would have said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in it the righteousness of God is concealed, you see, hidden. Then there'd be a place to hide. There'd be a safe corner to avoid this gaze of God, but how could Paul say, I'm not ashamed, the righteousness of God is revealed. And he was stuck there for some time. In his own writings, he gives this explanation of what happened to him. This is in 1515. This is a later discussion of it. He says, quote, the words righteous and righteousness of God were like a bolt of lightning in my conscience. Whenever I heard them, I was terrified. For if God is righteous, then he must also punish. Yet by the grace of God, when I was reflecting one time in this very tower and chamber on the words of Romans 1.17, quote, He who through faith is righteous shall live, and the just shall live by faith, and the phrase, the righteousness of God, the thought suddenly came to me. If it is through our faith, that we are to live as righteous ones. And if the righteousness of God is to avail for salvation to everyone who believes, 
then this righteousness will be ours not because of our merit, but because of God's mercy. Thus was my spirit lifted up. For the righteousness of God is that by which we are justified and redeemed by Christ. And those words became more pleasing to me. It was in this tower that the Holy Spirit revealed to me the scriptures. And that was, in Luther's own words, as he wrote later, the moment when the heavens opened, the light came in, and I was ushered into paradise. And I want to drop down to a little asterisk footnote here. I'm putting my Sunday school lesson right in the middle of this Sunday school uh, presentation this morning because my deep hope for every one of us in this room is that we have been ushered into that same paradise. This is the gospel. The gospel is that what we could never do on our own, no matter how many hours we confessed and no matter how much we beat our back and no matter how much almsgiving we did or how many other good works we piled up, none of it would count for anything except by a free gift of righteousness from God through Christ to us, received by faith. And it's on that basis that we have this wonderful opportunity to be free in conscience before him. This is, properly speaking, the beginning of the Reformation, of course, 1515. Luther went ahead cheerfully, happily, cranking out his commentary on Romans from that point on and continuing his ministry there in Wittenberg. And you begin to see a little change, of course, in the content of his ministry. It was in the same year, 1515, that Pope Leo X, Giovanni de' Medici, had bankrupted the papacy. We talked about that last week. Needed money. He didn't want to just go out and send uh, indulgent salesmen out to collect money to refill the coffers. He, had, he needed some greater grand design, of course. The rebuilding of St. Peter's seemed to fit the bill. And so we talked about this last week. 1515, the same year that these indulgent salesmen go out, fanned out across all of Europe, selling indulgences. One of the indulgent salesmen was a guy by the name of Johann Tetzel. He was a Dominican friar. He was a salesman par excellence. You know, all the old expressions, sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo and all of that, that's the kind of guy he was. He could sell anything. And he really liked the product that had been given him to sell here uh, in indulgences. So just about two years later, he made it to Wittenberg. And he was selling indulgences like hotcakes, you know, and he had all kinds of little ditties and rhymes and, and so on as he would, pre he would preach these very clever sermons, uh, inducing people then to spend, you know, their money to buy indulgences for a variety of uh, benefits, but he'd have little sayings like, every time a coin chings, a soul from purgatory springs, you know, that kind of thing, and uh, it was just, he was just classy, he was just good, and uh, so he was there, and he was getting quite a following, and of course, it's in the city of Wittenberg, where Luther himself is, is laboring, and he becomes aware soon enough of what's going on. And so as a result of that, Luther decides to pen 95 theological propositions questioning the legitimacy of the entire idea of selling indulgences, which we know of as the 95 Theses. Sometimes people think this is this very dramatic moment. You know, Luther goes down with kind of flair and tacks that thing up on the chair like some kind of gauntlet, you know, he's throwing down. Nothing like that at all. First of all, the 95 Theses were written in Latin. So nobody could read them unless they were already, you know, educated uh, in classical languages. Uh, they were also not intended for some kind of big public sort of uh, event. This was an invitation to the other faculty members at the university to engage in a disputation, which was a common way of, in, you know, doing educational labors, uh, over the 95 propositions that Luther had written. Uh, so he tacks it up on the church door at Wittenberg. By the way, that was a public bulletin board. He tacked it up right beside another sign that said, Reward Lost Cat, you know. <laughs> and on the other side, it said something about a rummage sale. It was just a bulletin board. And so this was not, again, some sort of highly dramatic moment as it's sometimes styled. It was, it was not intended to be that at all. But he tacks up these 95 theses. Everybody's heard of the 95 Theses. Very few people have read them. You are going to become part of that elite class of people this morning who have read at least some of them. 
So if you'll bear with me, this is going to take us about four minutes, all right? But I want you to at least get a flavor for uh, some of these 95 theses. The preamble said this, out of love and zeal for truth and the desire to bring truth to light, the following theses will be publicly discussed at Wittenberg under the chairmanship of Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts in Sacred Theology and regularly appointed lecturer on these subjects at that place. He requests that those who cannot be present to debate orally with us will do so by letter in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Not exactly an inflammatory kind of, you know, introduction, but that was kind of the, the force of it. But the 95 Theses themselves did have a little bit of bite. And so I just want to give you a flavor for them. It's only 95 sentences. The whole document's not that long, but just a few of them for your interest here. Number one, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Number two, this word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of penance, that is confession and satisfaction as administered by the clergy. Number five, the Pope neither desires nor is able to remit any penalties except those imposed by his own authority, as opposed to God's authority, and by those of the canons. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God, or to be sure, by remitting guilt in cases reserved to his judgment. If this right to grant remission in these cases were disregarded, the guilt would certainly remain unforgiven. The tenth one, these priests act ignorantly and wickedly who, in the case of the dying, reserve canonical penalties for purgatory. He doesn't deny, by the way, the doctrine of purgatory in the 95 Theses. He did ultimately, but at this point he's still working within the framework of that Catholic idea. But he is questioning, of course, the efficacy of indulgences to affect people's circumstances in purgatory. Number 11, those tares of changing the canonical penalty to the penalty of purgatory were evidently sown while the bishops slept. There's always a little bit of humor in Martin Luther's writings. Number 20, therefore the Pope, when he uses the words plenary remission of all penalties, does not actually mean all penalties, but only those imposed by himself. 21, though, thus those indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. As a matter of fact, the Pope remits to souls in purgatory no penalty which, according to canon law, they should have paid in this life. 27, they preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks in the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. We know who he was talking about there. It is certain, however, that when the money clinks in the money chest, greed and avarice can be increased. But when the church intercedes, the result is in the hands of God alone. 32, those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned, together with their teachers. 33, men must especially be on guard against those who say that the Pope's pardons, uh, the Pope's pardons are those uh, that inestimable, I'm sorry, I'm, I can hardly see this, uh, inestimable gift of God by which man is reconciled to him. I hope you can read this better than I can read mine here. 36, any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt even without indulgence letters. 37, any true Christian, whether living or dead, participates in all the blessings of Christ in the church and this is granted him by God even without indulgence letters. 43, Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better deed than he who buys indulgences. 44, because love grows by works of love, man thereby, thereby becomes better. Man does not, however, become better by means of indulgences but is merely freed from penalties. It's the old problem of being sorry for the consequences of sin and buying an indulgence rather than being sorry for the sin itself, which leads to true repentance. That's the point there. 45 Christians are to be taught that he who sees a needy man and passes him by, yet gives money for indulgences, does not buy papal indulgences, but buys God's wrath. 81. 
This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is due the Pope from slander or from the shrewd questions of the laity, like, 82, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the dire need of the souls that are there? If he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to build a church, the former reason would be most just, the latter most trivial. The Pope claimed to have power over purgatory. Luther's asking, why doesn't he just empty purgatory then, you know, if he's got that power? And why is he doing it at the expense of these, uh, 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 selling of these indulgences? Away then, the last uh, three or four. Away then with those prophets who say to the people of Christ, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Blessed be all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, cross, cross. And there is no cross, no gospel, you see. Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ their head through penalties, death, and hell. And finally, and thus be confident of entering into heaven through many tribulations rather than through the false security of peace. So, the 95 Theses written in Latin up on the church door of the Wittenberg uh, Cathedral. There was a guy that came walking down the street who happened to speak Latin. He read the 95 Theses and immediately recognized the inflammatory character of them. Without Luther's knowledge or permission, he took the 95 Theses down and trotted down to that local newfangled Gutenberg Press guy and said, hey, take a look at this. The 95 Theses were, of course, there was no copyright laws then. There was no violation here of any law that would have uh, prevented this. So he ran off, you know, copies of this. Within two weeks, the 95 Theses had spread through all of Germany. By the way, they were translated into German first. That uh, did facilitate the uh, dissemination of them. By uh, about three months, the 95 Theses had swept through all of Europe. It's one of the most amazing uh, expressions of rapid dissemination of a document that's ever been happened in history, given the technology of the time. And so Europe, I think it's safe to say, was absolutely aflame with this 95 Theses and nobody was more surprised than Martin Luther that uh, he was catapulted in this sort of overnight sensation into the public eye in such a remarkable way. So that all took place in 1517. It launches what's commonly called the indulgence controversy. The indulgence controversy began with polio not taking it very seriously. He thought, here's a wayward monk, it's not all that uncommon, we have these dissenting voices from time to time. Leo thought that he could simply put a little pressure on Martin and he would cave in and all would be well, and if not, just burn him. You know, that was his view, because that was the standard MO of the time for dissenting voices. So, uh, Luther at least uh, had an opportunity for on a couple of, actually four or five occasions on this, during this whole period, to meet with Catholic scholars and discuss and debate these issues. And the first major one was with a guy named Cardinal Cogetan. And this was, took place at Augsburg in 1518. Now Augsburg was outside of Saxony and Luther would never have been stupid enough to go there unless he was given safe passage from the emperor. And so the emperor actually granted to Luther imperial protection so that he could leave Saxony where he was basically protected and go and meet Cajetan there at Augsburg. But as it turns out, Cajetan didn't know that Luther had the safe passage. And that's the background for the uh, beginning. There's Cajetan, by the way. He does look kind of scary, doesn't he? Uh, so anyway, this is Luther reporting later what happened at this uh, colloquy in Augsburg. Uh, he says, quote, in the meantime, the Imperial Senate informed the Cardinal through the Bishop of Trent that I had been given of the Emperor safe conduct and that they should undertake nothing against me. At this point, even the Rhine burst into flame. When thereafter I returned to him, he wanted me simply to recant. Then I became very angry and addressed him without his, simple t without his title simply as you, and said, I cannot recant unless someone teaches me something that is better. I cannot abandon the scriptures. Then when he got nowhere with me with his rebukes, he shouted to me, Friar, Friar, yesterday you were very reasonable, 
but today you are completely mad. Then he confronted me with the papal bull extravaganta of Clement VI. However, I said that the Pope had <clears throat> misinterpreted the scriptures, and I argued against the Pope. Cajetan at this point became exceedingly angry and said, recant or don't ever return. I took the words, don't ever return to heart, and I left. <laughs> he left on horseback, by the way, because notwithstanding the safe conduct, he remembered John Huss, who also had a safe conduct to the Council of Constance and was burned at the stake there. And so he knew that that had its limits. And so he fled on horseback back to Saxony, where Duke Frederick, much at his own personal risk, protected Luther. Uh, he believed in Luther's cause. Uh, Frederick's always kind of an ambivalent character, and it's not a neat story, but he basically liked Luther, and he, put, he stuck his neck out there more than once to protect him. So even though there was huge pressure for Frederick to turn him over, to, to have him burned at the stake or whatever, which would have been standard fare, uh, because of Frederick's protection, basically, Luther was able to go from one day to the next. So he's protected uh, by, Luther, by uh, Frederick in that way. The next major hearing was in 1519, the next year at Leipzig, against probably the most formidable canon lawyer in the world at the time, a guy by the name of John Eck. Uh, John Eck was not simply a, a, you know, a person with theological education, but was an extremely competent lawyer, and so they had a gathering. And basically, John Eck succeeded in getting Luther to sign his own death warrant. He got Luther painted into a corner where he uh, agreed that the popes had erred, councils had erred, and so on, and that it was the Holy Scriptures alone that were his authority, and that he claimed a right to interpret the Scriptures contrary to the teaching of Holy Mother Church, and so on. And all of these things were just maneuvering Luther into uh, really capital offenses of the day, uh, which sort of spelled his doom. Uh, we certainly would have expected it. Strategically, at this moment, uh, the emperor died. And so, as I was saying, Duke Frederick had the opportunity, along with others, to elect the new emperor. And interestingly enough, Frederick himself was elected the subsequent emperor, and he declined the job. We don't know what course history would have taken if Duke Frederick had accepted it. He was an older man. I don't think he wanted the responsibility. And so he declined it. And on the next ballot, the guy that was actually elected to that post was Maximilian who was the grandson, Charles V, of Isabella and Ferdinand. I mentioned three weeks ago we would come back to this moment, and as advertised, here we are. So here is uh, the grandson, deeply Catholic, obviously, and deeply uh, loyal to his own uh, parentage and grandparentage. And so this is the young man, he's in his late teens now, who becomes the emperor in 1519. 1520, uh, Pope Leo issued the papal bull, called Exerge Domini. Here's our friend, we saw him last week, kind of uh, did a little recitation of his life. I want to give you a little fl flavor for this. This is the papal bull that actually banned Martin Luther. Doesn't excommunicate him yet, but it does put him under the ban, which uh, is the next best thing. And here's the uh, language of it, at least part of it. This is an excerpt. Uh, quote, uh, Bishop Leo, servant of the servants of God, arise, O Lord. That's what exerge dominate, domine means. Arise, O Lord, uh, judge thy cause. Remember how fools scoff at thee all day. Incline thine ear to our prayer, for foxes have come to spoil the vineyard, whose winepress thou hast alone trodden. And when thou didst desire to ascend into heaven to the Father, thou didst commit to the care, government, and administration of this vineyard, Peter as the head and thy vicar, and to his successors as the church triumphant. Now a wild boar, this has become a nickname, by the way, for Martin Luther, wild boar. Now a wild boar from the forest threatens to ravage the vineyard. Indeed, a wild animal threatens to pluck its fruit. Arise, Peter, and in accord with your position as protector and guardian, with which you have been charged by God, attend with zeal the cause of the Holy Roman Church. Arise also, Paul, we entreat you, for you have enlightened the church both by your doctrine and by your martyrdom. And finally, rise up, communion of saints and fellowship of the whole Christian church, that which we hardly dare to express because of the fear and anguish of our soul. 
has now been told to us in the reports of credible persons and information based on widespread rumors. In fact, we have unfortunately seen and heard with our own eyes many and manifold errors, some of which have already been condemned in the past by the councils and decrees of our predecessors and which obviously contain the heresies of the Greeks and the Bohemians. The Bohemians is a reference to John Huss. Others are clearly heretical or false or offensive, harmful to Christians, uh, Christian ears, or a de a deceptive of simple souls, all stemming from the perfidious servants of the faith whose arrogance impels them to seek the world's glory and to desire to be uh, and desire to be contrary to the doctrine of St. Paul, wiser than they have a right to be. Beyond this, we herewith condemn, by virtue of this decree, the St. Martin, his assenters, patrons, followers, supporters, and demand and command that they be considered such by all Christian believers, both male and female. In addition, we forbid all Christian believers, under any circumstances, to read, express, preach, praise, or print the writings of the St. Martin, so that his memory may be completely obliterated from the fellowship of Christian believers. Yes, they are to burn them. And in order to increase the disgrace of the St. Martin and those in accord with him, they are under every penalty of the law to personally to seize Luther, his assenters, patrons, followers, and supporters, and are uh, requested to hold them captive and send them to us in payment of which good deed they will receive a suitable reward and remuneration from us and from the papal throne. So there's a price on his head. Bounty hunters are out there looking for Martin Luther. His books are banned. By the way, he was excommunicated about a month later in January. This, this bull was issued in uh, December. Luther threw it into a ban bonfire in the streets of Wittenberg just to kind of celebrate it. Uh, the following month, uh, he was uh, excommunicated. His final opportunity to uh, stand before the church, of course, the very famous Diet of Worms, and I'm going to leave you with this uh, moment. He had uh, come to the, uh, hoping once again to have a conversation. There was no conversation to be had. This was strictly a last opportunity for Luther to recant or to face the prospects of it, the Diet of Worms. Uh, that was the only question on the floor. Will you recant? Luther famously took a a day to think about it, you know, I mean, this was kind of awesome, one monk against the whole assembled brass of church and state, very regal kind of assembly, and here he is, one guy all by himself, and what's he going to do? And after a night of agonizing prayer, uh, he comes back the next day and gives one of the most famous speeches in the history of the church, with which I will leave you uh, at this point. So Luther said, quote, since then, your serene majesty, and your lordship seek a simple answer, I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed, which is what they were accusing him of. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by evident reason, for I do not trust either in the pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Amen. Well, what happened to Martin? Boys and girls, you have to come back in a week to find out <laughs> what happened.